So uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a privilege to talk to you guys about security today. Um, hopefully this is, is useful and interesting. Um, so we're connected to the internet today uh, from more places and more often than ever before. And with so much of our data um, living and moving online, it's critical we take steps to protect uh, our users' data and, and also your own data. So this talk is really um, my call to arms is all of you as uh, developers. Um, and I hope in the next 30 minutes I can convince you uh, of the necessity and practicality of supporting secure HTTP um, or uh, TLS and give you some pointers to make it easier. Um, so let's see if I can actually push the slide down. Hmm, I'm frozen. <laughs> well, that's not good. My <laughs> mic is still on, by the way. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Let's see. Let's try again. Mm, sorry. There we go. All right, so uh, that's me. So I work at Google. Um, I've been at Google for about seven years, and the first five of which I was a, a software engineer, um, hired into a, a hired hacker team, um, meant to, intended to uh, improve the security of Google's web applications. So all of you guys, I, you have, all have my utmost respect because you build applications and you build software, and this is a much harder job than what I do, which is break software. So I find security holes in it um, and try to work with developers so that bad guys can't use those holes to actually exploit them um, or you know, break your software in unintended ways. Uh, today, I actually manage the Chrome security team. And it's about 20 engineers that try to make Chrome the most secure browser uh, and just generally improve internet um, security. So that's me. Um, but that's less important than what I want to talk about, which is TLS. So TLS, um, it stands for Transport Layer Security. It's the protocol formerly known as SSL. Um, and this is a cryptographic protocol that's designed to provide communication security over the internet. So TLS is the heart of secure HTTP, or HTTPS. Um, HTTPS is actually not a protocol. Um, technically, it's, it's the layering of security capabilities of TLS to standard HTTP. Um, and what it provides is privacy on the internet, uh, so via encryption, and communication integrity. Um, so this prevents somebody from snooping or tampering on your internet connection. And it's the industry standard for ensuring any kind of data communication security on the internet. So if you're into protocols, um, this is how it's, it's actually uh, layered on the, the internet protocol stack. Um, so HTTP and TLS are layered um, I will leave it as an exercise uh, for the audience if you want to actually read about the specifics of this protocol. But at a high level, there's two phases. So there's an initial phase, which is a handshake between uh, the client, and, and this is most commonly a browser, uh, and the web server. And this is based on public-private key cryptography. Um, there's this handshake that goes on, and you establish a shared secret. Uh, and this secret is used for the second phase of the protocol to actually encrypt uh, the communication of the session. So um, networking on the internet, it feels safe. You know, we open a browser, I'm sure some of you have a browser open now, we send off a request to load a page or some resource, the response comes back immediately and it's fast, it feels like we're talking directly to a web server. But in reality, there's almost always a few places that someone can access the network between your request and the service that you're trying to reach. So for example, um, everybody on the conference network, uh, you're going through a Wi-Fi router, and you're going through some internet service provider, and potentially other intermediaries before you reach your destination server. And if you're communicating in clear text protocols, like HTTP, you have no guarantee that the data hasn't been logged or tampered with. So this is known as a man-in-the-middle attack. And as the name suggests, it's when an attacker places herself 
uh, or her malicious software between the victim and some valuable resource, such as a website. So, um, for those of you that are open, using open Wi-Fi, do you know and trust the people that are operating the network? Or anybody else, everybody else in the room that's using the network? Um, do you trust the ISP that you're potentially using? So um, I'm really enjoying my time at Web Rebels uh, because I, I think everybody that um, I, I have met has, I, I've not met anybody who I, I am paranoid about um, their, their intentions. I typically am going to security hacker conferences where uh, you just don't know what people's motivations always are. So this is a picture of what's called a wall of sheep. So this is from DEF CON, which is the largest uh, hacker convention, um, takes place in, in Vegas every year. And the wall of sheep displays logged passwords um, and other data cookies um, pulled from HTTP traffic on open Wi-Fi network. Um, I actually put a wall of sheep on the back of the room for anybody that's using it. Um, just kidding. I, did, I wanted to see. <laughs> I wanted to see how many heads I could get turned. I got. A, I got a couple. Um, so sadly, people sometimes would see their password up there, and then they actually change their password still on the open Wi-Fi network. Um, and, and the point of this is really just to demonstrate that um, clear text protocols give you no security. This is just displaying them, but somebody could um, tamper with those, and um, you should assume no data security if you're not using TLS. So, even more depressingly, um, even if you want to use secure HTTP, you can still actually run into issues if the site doesn't avoid some common downgrade vectors. A downgrade vector is you know, where um, you want to be using or supporting HTTPS, but someone is able to actually force you into the unencrypted um, state. Users rarely type URLs um, into, into their browser, right? They're usually clicking the link, and um, if you know, uh, you unintentionally make an HTTP request, um, it allows an attacker a very small window of opportunity to downgrade them. And, and I'll talk about in the, uh, a little bit later about how to avoid those, um, but downgrade vectors are, are still a concern. Um, has anyone heard of Firesheep? Okay, a couple hands. So Firesheep was a tool that actually exploited um, this a downgrade vector. Um, and it made it really easy to do so in, in like a, an open Wi-Fi uh, situation. Um, what it did was uh, it looked at cookie headers that were being sent in the clear uh, for common services. Facebook was, was one of them. And uh, then it would hijack those cookies, and you could log into someone else's um, session and you know, be able to completely snoop on, on um, their session and whatever application um, was being exploited. So that's an example of an of opportunistic man-in-the-middle attack. Um, but we've seen recent international events that have just shed light on large-scale um, man-in-the-middle attacks conducted by governments, um, whether it's uh, monitoring or actually um, tampering of user connections, as well as internet service providers and large telcos. Um, they're commonly injecting ads or finding other ways to monetize traffic. So, man-in-the-middle attacks have been known about for a long time, um, but it's not just a theoretical risk. Um, we have mounting uh, and plenty of evidence that uh, the threat is real, and it's, it's more important than ever for um, us to be supporting our uh, websites over secure uh, transport. Okay, so uh, I, I know I'm, I'm like, uh, going to sound like a broken record, but serving over plain HTTP is totally insecure. Neither the browser nor the web server can trust that the data wasn't snooped or tampered with, um, and that's just a sad state for users and uh, web developers and, and site operators. So if you care about the privacy and security of your user's data, um, and this can even include the mere usage of the data, um, there's evidence of, of third parties um, monitoring just website um, uh, usage to, to kind of um, characterize behaviors of users. It's uh, paramount that you support TLS. Uh, and if you don't care about that, um, I'm really curious how interesting your app is or, or what you're trying to do. Okay, uh, so maybe some other people heard about this, how the internet is actually insecure and SSL is broken. Um, Heartbleed is uh, a bug that got a lot of headlines um, a couple months ago. So Heartbleed was a bug in a really common implementation of TLS. Um, 
There have been other problems with TLS in the past, both in terms of the protocol design and, and bugs in the implementation. Um, but it's still the best method we have today. And, and this has been fixed. Um, so don't write off the technology entirely um, because it's, it's got a little bit of a, of a big scar that it's healing from right now. Um, uh, it's still important. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you um, that you need this. And now I wanna go into uh, how to get it and, and um, debunk some myths. So one of the common um, excuses that I've heard from, from people um, is that they don't have TLS because of the performance or the cost. And to be fair, this was a legitimate concern 10 years ago. Um, as I noted, this first part of the protocol involves public key cryptography. And this is a really computationally expensive um, part of, of, of the protocol. And in the early days of the web, this actually required um, you know, additional hardware uh, and uh, to, to do both the, the cryptography and the, and the um, network offloading, but this is just no longer the case. Um, hardware has made great improvements and large organizations like Google and Facebook and Twitter, they can serve SSL to hundreds of millions of users around the world and they perform all of the SSL um, negotiation and computation on commodity hardware. So it's just not too computationally expensive anymore. Also, running an application over TLS, it's no different than communicating directly over TCP, which just means that there should be no application modifications you need to do to actually um, support secure HTTP. So you'll want to check all the operational pieces for how it's deployed, and um, if you just do is tlsfastyet.com, uh, there's a really nice um, deployment guide that you can go through. Um, it talks about things you can tweak depending on, on how big your service is. Um, there's just a great checklist and, and that's a good resource. So there are ways to um, tweak the performance if needed, but for a lot of sites, you're probably not gonna need to do anything. And then certificates, you need to get an SSL certificate. Um, it's actually, there's a number of services that actually offer them for free if you have a, if it's a non-commercial um, site. You can go to startssl.com, and um, I think you can go from creating an account there to buying the certificate to setting it up on your website in less than you know two hours easy. I, I did it and timed myself, and I was like watching a movie and eating snacks. So um, it's it's not a lot of, of time, and it's free for non-commercial sites. Um, if you if it's for a commercial site, um, you can get unlimited um, validation for about sixty dollars, which I think is you know also pretty reasonable. And then uh, TLS, it's, it's easy to deploy. It's sometimes, I, I might say it's deceptively easy to deploy because it's easy to make some mistakes too. Um, and again, the, this is a, a explicit link to this deployment guide, um, which just has details for um, you know, all the things you wanna do to set it up and, and manage certificates. Um, there's also a place to test your configuration and, and actually see if you got everything right. Okay, so now everybody wants TLS because it's um, important, it's cheap, fast, and easy. Um, there are a couple of gotchas um, I want to go through. So who has seen a screen like this? Okay, everybody, yes. Uh, so this is a full screen um, TLS interstitial. This you will see in you know, all modern browsers when there's an authentication error, when the browser detects an authentication error. We show tons of these in Chrome. Um, we show way too many of these in Chrome. And the problem is because the browser can't tell whether or not um, you're actually vulnerable to, you're, you're trying to be, uh, someone is trying to man in the middle of you, or the website just kind of messed up their deployment. Um, most of the warnings are from misconfigurations um, or sometimes captive portals, which is like when you're in a hotel and you know, they are an airport and they redirect you to their splash screen and um, those are actually a result of, of a lot of um, uh, these, these warning pages. The problem um, is one, uh, we show so many of them um, that users kind of become immune to them. So if it actually is a man in the middle attack, a lot of people are gonna click through them. The other problem um, is just that uh, as, a, as a web, I mean, you wanna fix it because you want your, your users to be able to trust the warning, but also, um, some research was done to actually show that if your website is misconfigured and, and um, pushing these errors, it actually could result in um, 
more than 30% of user traffic um, being dropped. So that's a good reason to, to investigate this. Um, Google has a tool, Webmaster Tools, which um, if you sign up for, we're going to be showing you, you as a website operator um, SSL errors in your configuration so you can actually get rid of these. Okay, so um, in terms of supporting uh, HTTPS, secure HTTP, uh, your site can fall into three categories. So either you're not supporting it at all and you only are uh, available over HTTP. Users should expect no security, but at least they know, you know what they're getting. Or you, the second category is you exclusively serve HTTPS. You don't support um, HTTP at all. And in this case, users can expect private and, and untampered communication, and, and this is a, a really good state to be in. Or sites support both. Um, and this is unfortunately where a lot of the downgrade situations are going to happen. Um, so if you can avoid this state, then that's great. It'll simplify your website, and you're gonna remove a whole class of bugs. <laughs> Otherwise, you have to keep paying attention um, to, to try to find out how to avoid um, these bugs. Uh, so the types of bugs that, uh, or the types of vulnerabilities that you're going to have are downgrade attacks, as we talked about, um, leaks cookies, and, and potentially even um, malicious script injection. So first, even if you don't care about security, you're going to want to fix mixed content issues just because of how modern browsers perform. Um, so as of Chrome 29, um, I don't know the versions of, of IE or, or Safari or Firefox, um, browsers will block um, any kind of mixed content that is active, so that's like cascading style sheets, JavaScript, iframes, um, and plugins. It's going to block them by default. So mixed content is where you have a, an HTTPS page, and it's actually including HTTP resources. Um, so it's going to mean your page actually looks broken. The reason for this is because like you have this secure page, but if it's including um, insecure content, then you actually lose the security of of the entire page, and um, we need to protect users, so we just block it. So you should fix it just because your page is going to look broken, um, but also because uh, it's, it's a vulnerability in your site. And to do that, um, it's pretty easy. Uh, what you want to do is make sure that your resources are loaded over HTTPS. So if the resources are on the same domain, you can just use relative URLs. And if you have to use an absolute path, you can actually just omit the scheme, and the browser will choose the, the correct one depending on, on how someone's accessing the site. Um, so the second example uh, actually shows a scheme relative URL that uh, I know, uh, surprisingly, a lot of people aren't um, familiar with, with that, but that is a, a valid uh, URL. And if the server you're using doesn't support resources over HTTPS, you may have to serve them elsewhere or enable HTTPS on that server. So a lot of CDNs offer this, um, or Amazon S3 offers affordable security content hosting for static resources. So those are options um, to fix that. So that's mixed content, which is the bigger one. Um, it's arguably harder to fix everywhere, but a really um, common application bug that also leads to downgrades is not preventing sensitive cookies from leaking over HTTP. So if your cookies are sensitive, um, and this is if they're like authentication cookies or saving preferences, then it's imperative that these never get sent over an unencrypted channel. Um, otherwise, an attacker can just sniff them and uh, hijack the session. And this is what Firesheep, that tool, did. Um, unless you actually add the secure attribute, um, your cookies are going to be sent in the clear. Um, so you have to make sure to add that. Um, it's unfortunate that that's not the safe default. And then uh, last but not least, um, an interesting recent development in the wild world of, of TLS is this new header called strict transport security. So this is a mechanism that allows websites to actually opt in for HTTPS only rendering um, and, and strict uh, certificate verification. So it's, it's uh, a way for a website to tell all browsers don't let it be possible um, for me ever to be man in the middle. And a, a website can never load anything, any of my resources, over um, HTTP. Um, once this, this header is, is set, um, the browser will just automatically bump all traffic up to HTTPS. And some sites are actually hard-coded into Chrome to use this, this header. Um, Twitter was actually one of the first uh, sites to do that, but there's a bunch of other ones as well. And uh, if you look at the 
the notes for the slides, you can see um, other services that you, you may use. And if you want to add your site to the preloaded list that Chrome uses, um, you can just file a bug with us um, in Chrome. So uh, I've spent my entire time up here talking about uh, how awesome TLS is, but I do want to make sure um, I don't leave people with the wrong impression because it's, it's not a um, security silver bullet. So first, TLS does not require 100% privacy. Um, because we're piggybacking HTTP entirely on top of this protocol, all of HTTP is encrypted. So we have the request URL and query parameters and headers and cookies that are encrypted. But because the host and IP address and port number are a necessary part of the underlying protocol, you can still infer those. And, and with that, you can probably infer, you know, potentially what site someone is accessing. Um, also for specific applications, it's been demonstrated by some researchers that um, you can actually leak useful information um, just based on uh, timing analysis and traffic analysis. This isn't a practical concern for most applications, and it's just really not something that probably most attackers are going to bother doing, but I, I want to mention it. Um, also, since TLS is a transport protocol, attacks at other layers of the network stack remain. So uh, in particular, IP level threats, um, if you've heard of sin floods or denial of service attacks, your, your website isn't protected by those just because you have TLS. Um, similarly, web application vulnerabilities um, are also still you know, a separate concern. So if you've heard of cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgery, TLS is not going to protect you from that. But that said, it's the best that we have today to guarantee any kind of um, networking, uh, data communication security. So it's still really important. important. So at the end of last year, the EFF published um, this report, Encrypt the Web, Who's Doing What? And uh, it shows you as a user um, what the state of uh, en encryption uh, support is for services that you may be interested in, maybe using. Um, as a user, you should be demanding this. Um, so file bugs, chime in on forums, um, reach out to the applications that you use because these guys only exist because of, of us. Uh, and then there's another really cool project called the SSL project. Uh, and this aims to measure the effective security of SSL across the internet. So they look at about 200,000 SSL enabled websites. And this is based on an Alexa's list of most popular sites in the world. They refresh their data every month. So it's more of an approximation of SSL adoption versus like actual um, measurement but they've kept the same methodology and sample set for a long time, so um, it's, it's still useful to see trends. Uh, about a year ago, um, this was about 22% of sites that were supporting SSL, so things have slightly improved, um, but it's, it's really not fast enough. So as developers, um, you can help us to improve this number. Uh, and that's all that I have. Um, yeah, so get TLS. Uh, there's a lot of resources um, to how to do that and, and things that I mentioned in the slides, which I'll post. But thanks. Thank you. So many questions. No, I've never heard of that. Okay. <laughs> What the question was for heart oh, about Heartbleed? Yeah, so um, so Heartbleed was a bug in OpenSSL, which is an is open source project. Um, we actually have some of the developers for OpenSSL um, on staff at Google. Um, Chrome actually doesn't use OpenSSL, so it wasn't impacted by this bug because we have our, our own implementation of it, but there were other Google services that used OpenSSL. Um, so I think we're, we're doing a couple things. One, uh, we have engineers, and we 
pay them uh, pretty much to work on this open source project because not only does Google rely on it, but a lot of the rest of the internet relies on it. Um, so in part, that's funding. And there's also separate funding to the project. Um, one of the people who discovered Heartbleed was actually from Google. His name's uh, Neil Mehta. And he's one of a number of people that are hired just to look for security bugs and to get them fixed. Um, so both the, the bug was found and, and patched by, by Google engineers. Um, and I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, long term, um, supporting open source projects and security researchers on like the good side of the fence um, is really what can, can help us prevent something like heartbreak. Maybe, maybe a good follow up on that is, um, is the model that we have for like such a fundamental tech, piece of technology that like I knew it was important, but I didn't really grasp how really important it is, and I guess m many, many here as well. Like is that model actually tenable for a piece of infrastructure that's so widely used? Or do we need to rethink how to, f like, how to fund these things or how to get enough resources or get even more people on it? Not just Google, but the entire industry or even like what can small companies do that rely on this or just want to help like pitch in a couple of bucks to, into a fund or whatever? Yeah, um, so, mm -hmm. so security is hard in that um, we, there will always be security bugs. It's, it's sort of a, a we, we know that and we expect that. And that's why it's important to be approaching this from a lot of different angles. There's, there's no silver bullet, bullet to fixing security. Um, and th that's one of the reasons it's interesting too. So, so we will never have enough money or time to be finding all the, all the bugs and that's okay. We, we then um, you know, also want to be incentivizing other people to find them. So Chrome and uh, for Chrome and also all of Google's web apps, we actually reward um, researchers or really anybody who finds security bugs. And if they report them to us, then we give them money. Um, and depending on the severity of the bug, we give them anywhere from $500 to about $10,000. Um, and this is one way for us to also kind of crowdsource um, improving security. Uh, of course, we could be, we could be, um, you know, doing more, but it's also about risk management in, in general, so. Right, but heart, heartbeat was like, <laughs> you don't want to calculate that risk, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. But yeah, good, good point. Um, linguistic question, why it's never a woman in the middle attack? Why is it never a woman? A, a woman, there's always men in the middle attack. So actually, um, I, 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 maybe people didn't get the number, uh, the number, but XKCD has a comic that I had in one of the slides, and it was a mommy in the middle. Right, so nice. yeah, when I post the slides, people will be able to check it out, or you can right. probably search mom in the middle. But yeah. uh, Total segue, this morning XKCD was down. Do you know if it's back up? <gasps> like anyone knows? Like this is important. <laughs> oh, okay, we'll, we'll check later then. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it worth using TLS between servers, even if you are in an enterprise system where, like, it's not actually on the internet? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I, I, the um, security is also about defense in depth and really not relying on any one um, point um, to ensure all of your security. So, um, within Google, for example, um, there is a, a, a famous Post-it note of a disclosed. Um, uh, from a disclosed NSA presentation about like a little smiley face of NSA man in the middling um, Google between data centers. Um, and uh, I think that's a perfect reason for why it's important to yeah, be encrypting um, between data centers even within the same enterprise. Or well, like, I don't know, if you're relying on like a, a VPN solution to do that, if, it, if you can breach in the, the, into the VPN, there's still the SSL to go through. Next. Yeah. Yes. All right, there's so many questions on, on certificates. I'll, I'll do that later. Um, oh yeah, this one. The, how useful is it for like, um, the web rebels website is served over TLS. My blog isn't, um, the, and you, know, you said like not everything is, like some stuff is still leaking. How useful is it like for everyday stuff? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, it depends. I, I wish that we lived in the internet where um, it was opt out of encryption, so I, I've never been to your blog, so I don't know, but maybe if, if you're talking about really... Um, There's some radical stuff on there. <laughs> uh, depending on... I it mean, is. The, the, people that, the, the people that read your, read your blog may be able to be profiled um, to have certain interests, and um, you know, that 
could be harming to them depending on, on what government they work in. So, so I wish it was just by default and people, you know, if they had a real reason that, um, you know, I don't want to support SSL, then they opt out of it. Um, otherwise, like I said, uh, if you go for a, for a blog or a personal website, start SSL.com, you can get a free certificate um, under, two hour, under two hours, you have it set up um, and, it's, and you're good. All right. Um, what, what can we do to get GitHub pages to support S SSL as just natively, but also for custom domains? Because that, like, I have like ten sites on GitHub pages, and I can't do anything about it. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I should talk to somebody from GitHub because I don't know what the, what their challenges are. One of the things, um, I, so I'm really passionate about making this easier, and I think one of the um, problems with SSL adoption has been not so much the, the protocol works and there's implementations out there, but actually. Setting up certificates and managing them and making sure they don't expire is just a pain in the ass. Yeah. So I think um, one of the things I'm excited about Google doing is trying to make this easier um, for our cloud platform. Um, I think Amazon is probably trying to do something similar as well too. And um, if GitHub runs on, on any cloud platform, then you know maybe they can just leverage that. Otherwise, um, hopefully there's other ways we can make it um, easy. Right, and then there's this whole like painful of like you have to have the private side of the certificate on somebody else's server, and then if they get breached, I'm fucked. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Not, not a pretty story. Uh, on usability, the like getting as the like, certificates is uh, annoying, right? And even like free uh, no start start SSL is a little bit like archaic in in web designy terms. Um, why couldn't Google just like have a service like the, 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 like I'm sorry like you do the DNS service that yeah. just makes it easy to get certificates for anyone. Uh, I we, it is in progress. Excellent news! You've heard it here first. <laughs> I had not expected that questions to get in a boss, but that's good. <laughs> um, why are self-signed certificates? Uh, why are they like displayed? If you showed all the the browser. Um, the messages that we get, why are they considered worse than, than proper CA certificates? Um, so there's no way to actually tell whether the self who is signing it is just a, a, a good behaving um, a web developer or a bad guy. Um, so the whole certificate ecosystem really depends on somebody else verifying your identity and that you actually are who you say you are. Um, there are weaknesses actually in, in this kind of transient trust as well too, but that's why the browser doesn't trust self-signed certs. It's no, there's no way for us to tell that anybody can make a self-signed cert, and the problem is anybody can make a self-signed cert. Right. Okay, so that, that also, like, that, that's a follow-up question basically on, so certificates do two things. They establish the identity and then they use that to do the encryption. Uh, why couldn't you just use one of them? But that explains the same thing, right? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, I think that's that's a good 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 way to get into that as well. Um, like uh, in the current political climate, and also with recent breaches for different CA providers, um, we can't actually like we we have this big chain of trust set up, but we can't actually trust that. How can we fix that? Yeah. Uh, so there's a couple things in progress. So uh, yeah, the certificate ecosystem. Um, it really relies on us being able to trust these CAs, and, and the problem is um, CAs can give other CAs permission to um, give out certificates, or if they get compromised, then you can't trust them anymore. So there's ways to do revocation, but that also doesn't work. Um, one of the things we actually do in Chrome, it's a big hack, but it actually it, it, um, has helped us detect man-in-the-middle attacks, is called certificate pinning. And this is actually, um, it's just for Google properties, but we whitelist what certificate authorities, authorities we trust to give out certificates for Google. Um, and by doing that, we actually got some warnings. Um, it was in 2011 uh, that helped us detect a large compromise of a Dutch CA called DigiNotar um, that was, uh, it was compromised. Attackers were using that compromised CA to issue certificates. Um, and Iranian citizens were being, Iranian Gmail users were being um, targeted uh, to man in the middle of their Gmail connection. So this certificate pinning hack is in Chrome, um, and there's a couple of other sites that we ha have added, but it's, it's a hack, it doesn't work generally. So there's another project called Certificate Transparency. Um, it's open source project, worked on by some, some people from Google, some other people, and the idea here is really to try to make 
um, a logging and audit framework for certificate authorities so that it's more transparent and everybody can be able to detect these types of things. The, the, um, that the certificate system is really one of the weak parts of, of TLS and right. it's hard to change. All right, so there's more questions coming in. I gotta screen them really quickly. Um, uh, how well supported is the strict transport security header by browsers? Like how widely is it supported? Which this, one? Sorry, the strict security header? Oh. Strict uh, transport security, sorry. Yeah, so um, Chrome supports it, Firefox supports it. I think IE does and I think Safari maybe doesn't, but I don't know. This is like a Jeopardy question that I right, would have lost sorry. all my yeah, money sorry, on. No, right. Yeah, sorry. But this is knowable. This, right. The internet knows this. Wow. That's the internet. <laughs> <laughs> that was the internet. Um, <laughs> uh, hard question for you, I guess. Um, the, c consider the NSA owns Google's private keys anyway, like what's it all worth for people who are more worried about governments than... Uh, S sorry, say sorry, again? So say the NSA owns Google's uh -huh. private keys or like access to everything, so what, what is worth having all the infrastructure and the supporting Google Chrome if some adversaries that I may be more worried about than individuals have access to them anyway? Yeah, I mean, um, so, so these are these are these hard like absolute questions of like what is the purpose of it all and um, I would I will say that um, you know I have I trust all of my my data on Google Google's business trusts all of its data on Google but I probably can't convince you know, whoever made the tweet or or the skeptics out there who who really feel that um, with any you know like factual answer um, we uh, I think go above and beyond because we know how important this is, both because the people who work at Google use Google and, and are, are passionate about the company, but also because like our business you know, relies on it. So uh, you cannot use the internet and you can totally get off the grid and, and you will probably um, you know, not have, you will, you will be at a lower risk of um, surveillance, but that comes with a cost too. A um, bit more back to the open source bits. Um, what's what what should be the future of open SSL? Is there like do you like there's a Libre SSL effort of cleaning everything up? Um, like what what are your thoughts on all this? Like should we fix the existing solution? Should we try it from scratch? Uh, should we use a memory no, safe language? No, we should we should not try it from scratch. Um, there are many implementations of of SSL and. Most often, um, so there's bugs in software. Um, OpenSSL, it's had bugs in the past. Heartbleed was a bad bug. There are more bugs, I'm, I'm sure of it. And, and they will be, will be uncovered going forward. Um, one of the advantages of open source is that you get more eyes on it. And I think um, one of the advantages of some of these vulnerability reward programs or just you know, um, incentivizing security, white hat security um, is that you get people with the right motivations improving the security of the software. So we should keep doing that. Um, you know, starting a separate project from scratch is, is also not gonna guarantee that it doesn't have security issues. Um, so we should keep do doing what we're doing and, and more of it. Um, and I think uh, I, when I started in security um, about 10 years ago, I think there was very little collaboration between um, many different um, private companies. Right. And I see the open source community and, and more private companies relying on open source software um, moving towards the trend where w we need to be working together. And um, we work closely with people at Twitter and, and Facebook and kind of um, at industry conferences share uh, information. And, and I think we need to keep doing that too because the good guys, um, they don't always work for the same company or on the same project, but they all kind of have the same goals. Right. Um, you mentioned as one way out uh, alternative TLS implementations, and they definitely exist, but most software out there uses OpenSSL, so they're the de facto API standard. Uh, would it be worth working on a common crypto standard? Maybe that's on a, like on a simplified, because everybody hates, like I actually have never programmed against OpenSSL, but it's notoriously bad. Um, so is, is it worth, um, like are now yesterday explained how you fix all the socket IO stuff with having a common layer on top of them? Like, is, would that be a worthwhile effort so I can switch between GNU TLS and OpenSSL and all the other ones if I wanted to? Uh, I mean, I think it's definitely worth pursuing. Um, yeah. It's uh, one of those things where uh, it could be, uh, right. and then it's, 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 a, it's an interesting idea, and 
uh, then it's, it becomes the burden of whoever is passionate about you know, pursuing right. that to, to demonstrate it. It's, well, the, it. The problem would be that there's like hundreds, like hundreds of thousands of software packages using OpenSSL, yeah. and it's like you can't switch at the end of story. Yeah. So. Anyway, <clears throat> sorry for the very hard questions. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, uh, one of the things, um, especially in the, so I'm from Germany, we have a very like, privacy conscious uh, society, and I'm very happy of that, about that because half of our country has been on a, a, like, in a surveillance regime, and like, people still alive like, having witnessed that. Um, uh, so in the, the, the last year since the Snowden revelations was like, lots of debate in Germany is still going on. Like, if it's not going on in your country, fix that. Um, one of the things that we usually hear from security conscious people, computer conscious people, is like everybody should uh, encrypt everything. Like everybody need to like we do have to do crypto parties and you learn Open GPG and all that kind of stuff that you, you need to do. And like we all know it's too hard for everyday people. Like even for, like I actually emailed with a crypto expert and we forgot the like re anyway we leaked some stuff that we didn't want to leak. Um, like and we know this stuff, right? It's so super hard to get right. Um, and now Harpleet happened, and that same people, literally the same people said, oh, we know everything's broken, you shouldn't have trusted in the first place. And you're like, <laughs> what the f <laughs> Right, like use, S like, use every SSL everywhere, TLS everywhere, or encrypt everything, but like, don't trust it. Like, what, where's the middle ground there? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is one of those things where um, I, it's hard when people take really absolute stance. Like, there are gonna be problems and, and bugs in, in things that mitigate risk, and you can either say like, well, the whole technology is, is, is worthless now because like there was this one bug, or you can say, look, let's fix the bug and the technology itself still provides value. Um, I do think security is too hard. And one of the things I'm, I'm passionate about is trying to make security um, easier or just you get it for free by default. Because I think like what's exciting about the internet, like I, I am interested in security and breaking software and, and um, you know, really being able to understand that field, but I recognize that most people that want to use the internet don't care about that. Um, they just want to have fun and they want to learn and they want to do cool things. And a lot of developers, like, they're, you want to make exciting and delightful and interesting and important software. You don't want to be spending your time managing SSL certificates. So I'm passionate about making it easier. Um, people that, you know, are gonna poke at one bug and say, like, the technology is, is useless. They're not passionate. They're grumpy cats. <laughs> They're grumpy cats, exactly. Excellent, all right. Um, now, like OpenSSL has like a, a bad reputation, but now like I've recently read a thing, um, like TLS itself has a bad reputation. Like, uh, it's, like it's based on very arcane things like ASN1, which nobody can read backwards. Um, like is, is it worth kicking that in the bucket and starting over? Um, no, no, I'm here to spread the good word of TLS. Right. Right, but like I'm PR. I'm TL. I'm PR for TLS. Okay, but like what? Like it's it's really broken. It's like really hard to implement. Really hard to get right. Even if you have the smartest people in re-implementing it in a memory safe language. Nobody should be re-implementing it. Or like, if, or if they start fixing it using memory safe language to avoid all these issues, like doing everything that Theodorat says, like doing all the good stuff. Um, and then it's it's still the, the protocol is still very too hard, too much code to deal with, and there's still bugs in there, and we are, we have still few, too few people who can can audit it, like. But what's the way out of, like, what's TS, TLS2? What, what's the road there? Um, so I don't think it's TLS as a protocol is fundamentally broken. I worry actually more about the certificate ecosystem. Um, I don't think OpenSSL is, like, it's, 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 you know, got a bad rap right now because of this bug, but I, I think it's overblown. Well, I, so it, people it, should, should use it, and they should still have, have confidence in it. Um, mm. And if somebody does want to implement it and has like really interesting security ways, then I would love to look forward and, and see that. I just know if history is any indication, when people try to re-implement crypto software, it usually introduces more right. bugs. So but then, then more generally, um, what what will, what will be a road to a TLS two? Um, I, I I guess I, I don't know. It's not it, uh, again. I think that the bug um, was. It was a, a implementation bug and a, a very well, yeah, small. Yeah, don't worry about that. For uh -huh. now. Like ignore you know, Heartbleed. Like we, we know TLS has a bunch of issues, um, and like um, there is there's there's like we all, there's always stuff to improve. And say we've sorted out all the like uh, certificate authority situation, and then we look at our risk profile. And it's like oh, the next thing is we should actually work on a TLS too. Um, like what will be? No, I don't know. Oh yeah, you don't I know. guess if I knew, I I'd be working probably, on it. Yeah, I'd probably go work on it. <laughs> all right, there you go. <laughs> All right. All right, this is a wrap. Thank you very much. Thank that one thank you doubly thank you thank for you. these incredibly hot questions. Um,